Hi all and welcome back to another video in which we are doing an in-depth review of Girl Defined's second book, Love Defined. Embracing God's vision for lasting love and satisfying relationships. I was going to say this before we start. I am quite ill today. I lost my voice over the last like four or five days and it's only just starting to come back so I'm sorry I sound like this but I don't have any more time to take off work. I'm going to Glastonbury next week and if I don't film now I'm not going to get a video out for like two weeks and it's going to be a whole nightmare and just everything is exhausting at the minute and difficult and I am very tired but in exciting news if you are going to be at Glastonbury this year then you can come and see me hanging around the Mandala and Toad Hall stages with Herd Collective who are a wonderful amazing bunch of ladies who if time and voice permitting I might be performing a little bit of poetry with them otherwise I'm just gonna be around there taking photos and videos and helping them out with stuff and they're wonderful people and you should come say hi if you're gonna be at Glastonbury because that would be amazing and hopefully I'll not be ill by then. <laughs> So in the last two parts of this review, which you absolutely don't have to have watched before this video, uh, but we saw Kristen and Bethany, who, if you don't know, where have you been? But they are two fundy Christian sisters who decided they wanted to write a book about love, dating and marriage aimed at teens and young women. And we've been doing kind of like one part of the book per video, which is like a number of chapters. And in the first two parts, they said some really disgustingly homophobic and transphobic stuff about real women and real marriage and all that horrible stuff. You know the sort of thing, you've heard it before, we've all been disgusted by it before, it's not okay. They also told us how awful culture's idea of dating is, in which they completely understand what culture actually means and how it changes depending on time and place, and they build up this like terrible straw man and then get really smug when they can just knock it down, and then they offer their own incredibly vague God-centered solutions to these problems that they've just made up out of nowhere. They also, in the first parts of this, this book, came to the shocking realization um, in their mid-twenties that, oh my god, did you know it actually matters who you marry and not just that you get married? I'm not even joking. That was a revelation to them and it shocks me. And then they warned us as women that we should never chase men, never ask men out, and always just settle for whatever you can get. Oh, and biblical gender roles mean you need to act like a slave and enjoy it. Or at least pretend to. Put a smile on your face and deal with it. Now what's really, really interesting is that while writing this book, one of the sisters, Bethany, the younger one, was single herself. And not just single, but 30-something, never been kissed, only dated one guy as a teen, no real world experience, single. So, this next part of the book, which we're going to be reading and reviewing today, is mostly led by her. And it's called Single and Waiting to Mingle. And as a single girl myself, I'm keen to know what she has to say. Or at least I was before I read it. Spoilers, I've read it. I don't know what she says. What I will say is the bits of the book we're going to be looking at in this video are not half as bad as the other parts that we've read from them and I think that's a really really positive thing because you know on the one hand it means this video isn't quite as dramatic. It's not all outrage and drama just like real life and that's okay uh, which means it might not be as interesting for some people but it is real and I like that. The other thing is that I do think it shows that Kristen and Bethany do have the potential for good in them. They do have the potential to teach women helpful things when they want to, when they're not being hateful and hurtful. But I also think it's important to remember when we discuss this stuff that just because Kristen and Bethany have said and done some really, really horrible and hurtful things in the past, that doesn't diminish when they do something good. But similarly, when they do write something good, that doesn't diminish the bad things they've done either. I think we can acknowledge the good while recognizing and critiquing the bad at the same time. I also think it's really important when we recognize that there are people out there with harmful views like Kristen and Bethany's, where they're homophobic, where they're transphobic, where they're just kind of very dismissive of anyone who isn't themselves. I think it's important to recognize that with people like that, the way to get through to them <clears throat> and their young impressionable audiences who are vulnerable and are just kind of eating up their hate-fueled teachings, I think it's important to recognise that the way to get through to them is not by just blindly being like, oh my god, they're horrible per people, what bitches, what other names and like, you know, like, no name-calling, no, they're lost, 
denounce them, get them out of here forever, they'll never be good people, they're awful, take away their platform. Like, I don't think that's the way to get through to people like this because ultimately people like Kristen and Bethany are a product of the environment that they grew up in and continue to be around. So I think the way to overcome that stuff is not through like name calling and nastiness, but by calmly correcting their misinformation and by acknowledging when they do good and praising that and not just shouting down the bad stuff all the time. It's like when you're training a dog, you know, it's about positive reinforcement. You don't get anywhere when you just scream and shout at a dog and hit a dog or call a dog names. Like, that's horrible and that's never gonna work. If you're house training a dog, for example, and it accidentally pees on the floor, you don't get anywhere by screaming and shouting at it and making it scared of you. Instead, you need positive reinforcement of like lots of, oh my God, good girl, well done, you're amazing, and treats when they pee on a puppy pad and later when they pee outside. Positive reinforcement, you know, I think that's way more helpful than just anger and vitriol. And I think it's important to remember that Kristen and Bethany are human like anyone else and that does mean that they have flaws and that does mean that sometimes their views are flawed as well and we need to remember that when we critique their views because the moment we forget that they're human too, no matter how awful the things they've said are, but the moment we forget that they're human we become just as bad as them and then the whole world's a big mess, isn't it? So, I'm not saying we have to go easy on them when they are homophobic or transphobic, I'm not saying, oh, be kind to them, be nice to them, pat them on the back and say, there, there, it doesn't matter. I'm not saying that. I'm saying critique those things, absolutely, but also try and understand why they've come to these views and help break that down and help them rebuild a different worldview instead and praise them when they do good things and hopefully, like, help them become better people in the long term. I hope that makes sense. That was very off script. I have no notes for that. I'm just rambling a bit and I'm ill, so maybe that was nonsense, but enjoy. <laughs> now, one more final disclaimer before I start reading Bethany's single girl part of this book. And this is just about me and where I'm coming from in reviewing this. Unlike Bethany when she was writing this, I am single now, but I have also had long-term relationships before, including like a big four-year one where I lived with a man, adopted Cairo with him and everything like that and then our lives started going in different directions and I was unhappy so I broke up with him. And on top of that, I've had a lot of dating experience, sadly. Some good, some bad. It's a mixed bag, you know, it's life. I would also say that right now, kind of generally in my life, I'm single by choice. I do have a lot of options and a lot of interest in me, but I'm also quite fussy and I'm also very happy on my own. And I think it would take someone very special for me to want to give up my singleness, if that makes sense, you know? I'd rather be single than settle, is the way I'd usually put it. And I'm very happy on my own, and marriage is not something that's ever really been a big goal for me. Kids is never, ever, ever going to be a goal for me. I do not want them. I am absolutely child-free by choice. So in that respect, I don't have any timelines or time constraints or anything like that to stick to. So I'm, I'm very lucky in that respect and I can take my time to, you know, date around and meet different people and only settle down with someone if they're completely right for me. I don't have this pressure that Bethany and a lot of other women have. So please bear in mind that my circumstances are very different from Bethany's and neither one of us is right or wrong in terms of what we want or wanted from life. When Bethany was writing this book, she actively wanted to get married and have kids and all that stuff. And again, nothing wrong with that at all. The issue is she writes with the assumption that everyone wants the exact same thing as her, especially all women. She assumes that every woman is a cis, straight, monogamous Christian who wants as many children as possible and that's where there's huge flaws in her work because it's absolutely okay to write with that audience in mind but the problem arises when you assume everyone in the world is or should be in that group. Do does that make sense? So straight off the bat, we have to recognize that me and most people in the world are gonna have very different experiences and expectations and needs to Bethany. And does this mean her ideas are wrong? No, not at all. But we do have to acknowledge that they're limited. A lot of Christians do get mad at me when I review these books because they say, well, they're not for you. Why are you mad that she's encouraging homophobia, transphobia, spreading harmful messages, encouraging women to stay with abusive partners and etc. And for one thing I say like, well, I think it's obvious why I'm upset by it. But also, anything that spreads intolerance and harm and hate, like I just said in the last little rant bit, 
needs calling out regardless of the audience it's intended for. You wouldn't stand by while Hitler was giving a speech about, you know, killing all Jews, killing all black people, killing all gay people, just because, oh, well, I'm not a Nazi, so I'm not in his target audience. You wouldn't stand by while that was, I know, no, that's an exaggerated example, but you wouldn't stand by while that was happening, so why would you with anyone else? And I think the second thing that I think many people misunderstand is something that, again, I just briefly touched on, but while it's okay to have just one target audience for your book or your product or whatever it is you're selling and to talk only to them, what's not okay is producing that content with the implication that anyone outside of your target audience is bad, wrong, sinful, going to hell, miserable, only your way is right. And that's exactly what Kristen and Bethany do. It's like if I wrote a book on caring for dogs and in it assumed that anyone who had a cat or mice or rats or lizards or fish, they were all terrible, horrible people. And I said as such in my book, like, this is how you care for dogs and screw these cats, you're going to hell, you know? <laughs> kind of the equivalent of that. Having a target audience is fine, shaming anyone outside of that demographic is not. Kristen and Bethany write so that anyone who does things differently to them is shamed. And I'm here to make sure that by reviewing these books and making these videos, people know that some of what they say is misinformation, some of what they say is harmful, there are alternatives, and that there is no shame in being, for example, queer or trans or poly or asexual or any of the other things that Girl Defined shames and shuns repeatedly in their work. I will never ever have a problem with Kristen and Bethany giving audience specific advice such as, hey, have you tried praying with your partner? Because while that doesn't appeal to me as an atheist, I'm like, yeah, that seems like great advice for a Christian audience. Good on them for saying it. But I will always have a problem with them doing things like promoting pro-conversion therapy books and content or being completely exclusionary with their definition of real women and so on. And so with that in mind, let's jump into reading some of this actual book. As I mentioned, there are five parts to this book and normally I go for one part per video, but part three, Single and Waiting to Mingle, is very short and, if I'm gonna be honest, fairly boring. So we're also gonna cover the first couple of chapters of part four too. Part four is the biggest part of the book, it's quite long, so we're gonna split that over two videos and also throw part five in with the next one as well, because why not? <laughs> So part three opens with chapter eight and is titled, When Your Heart's Desire Is Unfulfilled. And this chapter opens with Bethany crying over not having a man as she's approaching her thirties and she's wondering if God had forgotten her. And there's a woman who is also approaching her thirties. I don't really relate. <laughs> with my knees pulled up against my chest, I, Bethany, let my tears flow freely. How could this be happening to me? How could I possibly be pushing my late twenties with no guy prospects in sight? Was long-term singleness really God's plan for me? The questions, doubts, and worries rushed through my mind. The more I thought about my current state of aloneness, the more I cried. Why, I wondered? Why doesn't God bring me a husband? And then we get the perfect example of everyone must feel the exact same way as me when she says, if you're currently single, I know you can relate to what I'm saying. I know you understand the confusion, worry, and sorrow that often occupies those lonely Friday nights at home. I know at times you've been the girl crying on her bed, wondering if things would ever change. I don't know, I'm certain there are plenty of single girls who do not relate to that. I'm sure some do, but again, it's this assumption that everyone's the same. It's it's like she's trying to be inclusive and be like, we're all in this boat together, while making anyone who isn't in the boat or is like, you know, sat on the edge of the boat or whatever, making them feel completely excluded. Like, you know, if they're hovering on the edge of the boat, it's like, oh, sometimes I feel lonely, but sometimes I'm quite happy. She's like, into the ocean with you. We all feel the same. Go drown. She does acknowledge that unwanted singleness in any season of life can be really difficult and painful, but fails to realise that it's not unwanted for everyone. That said, the next part I do quite like. Shocking, I know. When I was single in my early 20s, I often found myself trying to endure my singleness. I would think to myself, once I'm married, life will really begin. Until then, I'll just try to get through these in between years. After years of living with this type of mindset, I realised that my perspective on singleness was all wrong. I was discontented and lacked joy. I wasn't living my life for God's glory. I was playing the waiting game, waiting for Mr. Wright to come along, waiting for him to make all my dreams come true, waiting for him to put a ring on my finger, waiting for him to make me a complete woman, waiting for marriage to come knocking on my door so life could finally begin. And I actually relate to this so much. Not the marriage part of it, but the 
waiting for your life to begin part. That is something that I relate to and I think I've spoken about in other videos as well. I think it's a really, really important thing to discuss and bring up. I spent like long stretches of my teen years waiting until I could move away because once I'm out of Henniston, I'll be happy. And then once I was at uni, it was once I graduate and get a job, I'll be happy. And then when I took a year out and was working, I was like, oh, well, once I get back to uni and finish my degree, I'll be happy. And then once I graduate, I'll be, and I was constantly just waiting for things to happen to be happy. And it wasn't until I was probably about 23 that I realized I needed to stop waiting for things to happen on everyone else's schedule and just start doing what I wanted in the moment because otherwise I was just literally wishing and waiting my whole life away. So even though Bethany doesn't quite say this, I think that's the point she's trying to make here and I actually think it's quite an important and useful one. So good on Bethany. Uh, then she begins to realize that she's been believing lies her whole life and lists them and corrects them and these lies include, I'd be more valuable if I had a husband, I must have a boyfriend husband to be happy, my life doesn't really begin until I get married. And her answer or solution or truth to all these things is mostly God, which is fine for her, uh, but that aside, again, I don't hate this part either. Ultimately, what she's saying is that you already have value in your life without having a relationship. You can already do awesome stuff while you're single. A relationship isn't needed to complete you. And I really like those messages. I think they're great and I think they're important for everyone to hear and understand and internalize. So again, good on Bethany. That said, where I do disagree with her is in the next section when she says how if you're unhappy with being single, it all comes down to a lack of trust trust in the goodness of God and that the only solution is to make sure our trust in God is secure. Now if you're Christian this is fine, I'm not going to tell you not to do that, not to trust God and whatever, but what I am going to say is that she's missing out on something huge which is true for all people, religious or not, and that I think ultimately if you're unhappy with being single what it actually comes down to is a lack of trust in yourself and I think this is true for everyone, regardless of if you're religious or not, regardless of your gender, regardless of your sexuality, regardless of anything. I think it's all about a lack of contentment with yourself. And the solution to that is to make sure you're comfortable by yourself, happy by yourself, know how to look after yourself, know how to amuse yourself. Um, and I've said it before, I'll keep saying it, but I think a relationship should add to your life. It should be the dessert at the end of a nice meal, not the sustenance itself, you know? I just said it better in this clip. I wasn't ill then. <laughs> For me, I see a relationship more like a nice pudding at the end of a fancy meal, you know? I mostly want a good main course. That's what's important to me. That's my work, my house, my dog, my friends. That's my good meal. Once I've got that, wonderful, very happy. And then if I have room at the end of the meal, if I'm still a bit hungry, I'll happily enjoy a dessert too. Love it, love a good dessert, you know? But if I'm already full, I'm not gonna force myself to have one. That's gonna be silly. I'm gonna like make myself feel sick and I don't want that. It's gonna ruin the rest of the meal, isn't it? If I force myself to eat some food I have room for. Similarly, if I'm a bit hungry and I think, oh, you know what, I do, do fancy a pudding today. And then the menu comes and all they have is seven kinds of rice pudding. God, and I hate rice pudding with a passion. I'm not gonna force myself to have pudding just because it's there when I don't like it. I'd rather wait and hold out and go home and have a nice piece of chocolate fudge cake with caramel sauce. Wait, no, that sounds dirtier than I meant it to. I re I just really like cake. Um, <laughs> once you've got your core meal sorted, if you want the pudding, only have it if you've got room for it and it's something that you like and really, really want. Don't force yourself to have an extra course that you can't fit into your meal and that you don't really like. And it's the same with relationships. A relationship should be like the cherry on top of your life. It should fit in there nicely. It should add to your life. It should make it better. You shouldn't just feel the need to have it because everyone else is having one. You shouldn't feel the need to have it just because it's there, you know? It's gotta be something that adds to your life. But we all know Girl Defined would never agree with that because they don't believe in self-care. They think it's selfish and sinful and you should never put yourself first. And then they throw together another one of their ridiculous acronyms. There's like three of these in every chapter and it gets really exhausting after a while. Like I get a couple are great to like drive a point home, but when there's like a book filled with 40 of them, they all just blend into one after a while and they get quite boring. This one though is trust. Because as a single girl, you have to turn from sinful thoughts, remember God, 
uplift him and blah blah blah. Like I say, it's quite repetitive, it's boring. So let's just skip forward to chapter nine, which is called Five Strategies for Thriving as a Single Girl. Ooh, I'm really struggling with the energy today, I'm sorry. Now this chapter opens with Bethany making a big mistake, huge. She tried to buy mascara on Valentine's Day. I know, it's shocking, how could she? She says, as I stood in line waiting to pay for my makeup, the reality of my utter singleness stared me hard in the face. Another Valentine's Day was about to come and go and I was very much single. No prospects in sight, no potential interests, no one on the horizon, no Valentine's Day date this year except for my dog Fluffy, but I don't think she counts as a true Valentine. Try telling that to Coops. She's my Valentine every year. I love her so much. It's a bit dramatic, but I get it, you know. I've absolutely cried in public after breakups or after being in a shop and seeing like Mother's Day and Father's Day cards when I'm like not close to my parents and they've done something to hurt me recently, so I won't judge. I know public holidays like that are hard and when it's like thrown in your face that other people are happy and together and they have families and you're like not. Yeah, I get that, so I'm not gonna judge her for being upset by that stuff. And she actually goes on to say how this particular year she felt surprisingly okay with being single, so good job Bethany, that's surprisingly mature from her and I'm impressed, you know? Credit where it's due. Like seriously, she even says, Coming to this moment of complete joy, peace and contentment as a single woman was a crucial turning point in my life. Instead of viewing my singleness as an in-between stage, I had grown to truly love and enjoy it. And no sarcasm, I think this is really, really great. And then Bethany goes on to give five strategies to cope with being single, you know, to cope with being single. Um, and literally all of them come down to be more religious, which is a bit of a shame, but let's take a quick look at them and discuss how we can actually apply these to kind of anyone regardless of religion or not and if they're a good point or not. So the first one is live all out for Christ. Bethany says, we as single women have endless potential to make an impact for the kin kingdom of God. We have energy, often youthfulness and availability to invest in those around us. We have a certain amount of flexibility that married women do not have. Instead of wasting our days waiting for the next season, let's live with purpose and intention. So again, very Christian specific, but let's change this one up a bit. Live all out for yourself, you know? Do anything you've ever wanted to do. Go anywhere you want, meet new people, try new hobbies, uh, volunteer for a new charity, learn new skills, move to the other side of the world for your dream job if you want to. I absolutely adore living on my own because I have so much freedom, I can go anywhere, do anything, see anyone, I never have to be home for a certain time, I never need to ask anyone permission before I do something, I don't live by anyone else's rules except my own, I have my own space, I can decorate as I want, I spend my money as I want, be as clean or as messy as I want, eat what I want and when I want, and it's all incredibly freeing and I love it. And I've always said it would take someone damn special for me to like give up all my freedom for them, you know? And all this like freedom and space that I have, yeah. <laughs> Bethany's next point is intentionally grow in godliness. And she says, I encourage you to utilize your time to grow in godliness. Find something that works for you. After Kristen got married, she encouraged me to intentionally use my single years to grow. She said, the more I invest in my character now, the greater a blessing it would be to my future marriage. I encourage you to take her advice as well and invest in developing your character. And again, this is actually fantastic advice, but it doesn't just have to be a religious thing. Use your time alone to work on yourself. Go to therapy, figure out who you are, take a class, learn a new hobby. Don't be afraid of doing things by yourself. I absolutely love and I'm very grateful that I have the confidence to do lots and lots of things by myself. So I go on day trips for myself, I go shopping alone, I take myself out for dinner and cocktails, I go to museums and art galleries by myself, I go cycling alone, I take Kyra for walks alone and we go mushroom spotting and we do all this stuff, just me and her or sometimes just me and I love it all. And yeah, it can be a bit scary at first going out alone and sometimes you're like, oh, they're judging me. Like, it doesn't matter in the end, does it? What matter matters is that you're doing something that makes you happy and you're just going for it. And this might sound silly, but I do think you become much better company for others when you learn to appreciate and enjoy your own company. And it just opens up this whole 
world of new opportunities to you and yeah I, I love doing things alone, I think it's great. Uh, point number three is look for opportunities to serve. Bethany says many needs exist in our churches and communities, young women need godly role models and mentors. Elderly people are in need of love and companionship. Young mums could use a helping hand. If we open our eyes and start looking around us, it doesn't take long to find a need. Instead of waiting for opportunities to come our way, let's intentionally go after them. Let's proactively seek out opportunities to serve. And I actually think this is fantastic. It's really nice to see something not selfish in a girl-defined book. This doesn't have to be a religious thing either. Just, you know, find a way to give back to people in your community in whatever way you can. I think that's pretty great. Point four, and this is where things start getting repetitive, she says, embrace the unique aspects of this season. I encourage you to do this by embracing the unique aspects of this season and, and making the most of it for God's glory. Take advantage of the opportunities to invest your time in things you couldn't do if you were married. This is literally exactly the same as the first point, so... Yeah. And then point five is expand your community beyond only singles. Bethany says, in our society, people tend to congregate by age and stage of life. Kids hang with kids, teens hang with teens, college kids hang with college kids, singles hang with singles, married people hang with married people, old people hang with old people, the groups don't mingle a whole lot. Instead of restricting your community and friends to strictly singles, try mixing it, up, mixing it up a bit. If you're willing to expand your community beyond only singles, you'll mature and grow in ways you don't you wouldn't have before. So I don't know if I actually agree with her that people only spend time with people at the exact same stage of life as them. Like, as you hit your like early 20s, in my experience, that doesn't really happen anymore. <laughs> Once you get a job and make friends and get, in the, get out in the real world, you do meet all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds. So while I think this is good advice, I'm dubious because I think it's something the average person already does. And then Bethany ends on the point of making sure that you're thriving in life and not just surviving, which is something I actually always talk about myself and I think is excellent advice, so I have no issues there. And that's the end of part three. All in all, I think this is the best part of anything I've read that they've written. Um, and I do read a lot of their stuff. Um, it's not particularly unique or well-written or compelling, but it's not overly offensive, it is quite useful, and it's not as exclusionary as some of their stuff. So I never thought I'd say this, but decent job, Bethany. Well done. So now let's move on to the first part of part four of this book called Working Through the Nitty Gritty. And as I said, this is the biggest part of the book, so we're going to be looking at the first half of it briefly in this video. Chapter 10 is titled How to Be just friends with a guy. Now, this may be a spoiler, but my advice for this would be in exactly the same way you're just friends with a woman. Crazy, I know, wild, but maybe that's just my crazy, non-sexually repressed brain doing something wild because I'm able to view people of the genders I'm attracted to as things other than sex objects, but maybe that's just me. You know all that maturity and growth that I said Bethany showed in the last part of this book? She manages to undo so much of it within the first two paragraphs of this chapter. Such a shame. Tears streamed down my, Bethany's, face as I vented my frustration over a fizzled friendship with a guy. Why do friendship with guys always have to end this way? I asked Kristen in frustration. I thought we agreed to be just friends. Why did he have to break our agreement? Trying to be just friends with guys, whatever that means, and balancing the never-ending who likes who drama is tough. The two of us, like most girls, struggled with being just friends with guys when we were younger. Even though we were intentional about not casually dating around, it was still hard, it was still confusing. I didn't want to continue moving forward in an endless season of awkward friend zone relationships. In my heart, I knew there had to be a way to have appropriate, healthy, and God-honoring friendships with guys, I just wasn't sure how to achieve that yet. Maybe just a personal thing, but I genuinely hate anyone who uses the term friend zone unironically. Um, and then her advice from this is just very odd. Don't make your guy friendships all about the two of you. Do your best to keep your friendship focused on group settings. Work hard to incorporate others into the relationship. Don't make the relationship deeply emotional and feelings oriented. Try not to share deeply from the heart in ways that would draw you two together in an unhealthy and emotional way. Save the deep emotional stuff for your girlfriends. So she's literally implying that you can't have an emotional connection and, you know, a genuine friendship with a man without it turning sexual in some way. It, 
it's very bizarre. I understand that like in a friendship, if one of you has romantic feelings and the other doesn't, then it's important to set boundaries so that no one's feelings get hurt, no one's put in any danger. But Bethany seems to be implying that this is gonna happen in all friendships. Very odd. What do you think Bethany would say to like bisexual people? Are they not allowed to have any friends or emotional connections with anyone just in case like, you know, a conversation about I feel sad today turns to someone slipping and falling into someone's genitals, you know? But the thing is, I see why Bethany thinks this, and it's not a problem with friendships in general, it's a Bethany problem. Bethany admits that she's the one who always seems to cross these boundaries in friendships. She says, I wanted the attention, I wanted the focus, I wanted to feel special and valued. Out of selfishness and convenience, I had used those friendships to make myself feel good. I excuse my actions by saying we're just friends, and then I'd allow those friendships to go down a not so just friends road. This is a you problem, Bethany. This isn't a people in general problem. Stop telling people they shouldn't have perfectly normal, healthy friendships just because you don't understand how to keep your sexual desires in check around, apparently, any one of the opposite sex. Then they say there are literally only two types of women. Women who flirt with and want attention from all men, and women who are scared of men. Entirely ridiculous, like how sheltered are they? And then, because remember they like lists, here are five sets of questions you need to ask before having any male friends. Uh, how much time do I spend with this friend? Am I intentional to make sure the time I spend with him is group oriented? Am I trying to find my identity and worth in the amount of time I spend with him? Am I neglecting my girl friendships or my friendship with him? I don't think these last two are healthy for any friendship, to be honest, male or female, well, whatever. Two, are we getting emotional? Opening up, sharing deep feelings and discussing personal topics can lead to a just friends relationship down a dangerous path. Intimate conversations will create intimacy. Be careful about the type of information you share as well as the information you are willing to receive back. Am I cautious with the information I share with him? Do I share personal and or intimate things? Do I pour my heart out to him? Do I use him to satisfy me emotionally? Yeah, because how dare you have an emotional connection with a friend? How dare you? How dare you ask your friend for support and support them in return? These are perfectly normal, healthy parts of friendship and it shouldn't matter what gender it's with. These are normal friendships, it's okay. Let's throw three and four together. What do we talk about? And is this guy God a god <laughs> and is this guy a godly friend for me? Does this guy push me closer to Christ or pull me away from him? I put these together because the description she gives for them, they're basically the same. Hello Coops. These two points basically just say, don't you dare flirt with a friend, only talk about God. And the flirting thing I agree with, but everything else. It just, it must be so boring to be Bethany's friend, and I don't mean that in like a just petty insult kind of way, like, but there's nothing wrong with being religious at all, but if it's your only interest and personality trait, that just must be such a dull life, you know? And five, how physical is our friendship? Many single guys and girls struggle in the area of physical touch and affection. Make sure your friendship is marked by purity and holiness. You should be encouraging him towards purity in your physical contact. Interesting how it's the woman's job to encourage the man towards holiness and not the other way around. You should be encouraging him towards purity in your physical touch. Once again, it's putting all this like, blame and shame on the women for like saying they encourage men in sexual ways and so on. It's just, it's typical girl to find, isn't it? She wants you to ask, am I honoring my future husband in the way I touch this friend? Now, I get you should be considerate of how you interact with other people if you do have a partner at the time. You definitely shouldn't be touching or flirting with anyone else if you're in a monogamous relationship, but if you're single, you really don't owe anyone else anything in how you interact with others, other than the person you're interacting with, obviously, making sure that it's respectful and consensual, obviously. Um, and then Bethany goes on a little self-congratulatory rant about how she's so intentional in her friendships with men now, and she just sees them as brothers in Christ, which is kind of hilarious because she ended up marrying one of her just friends, he's sound like a brother to me. So, I don't even know at this point. <laughs> Um, but yeah, all in all, still not that hateful and harmful compared to most girl defines usual stuff, so yeah, good, good, 
goodish job again, you know? Moving on to chapter 11, and this is the last one we're gonna be talking about in this video because my voice is about to give up. I'm really struggling. We have the interestingly titled chapter, Is it okay to date a non-Christian? And is it okay for a Kubiku to interrupt yeah. my video with cuddles? And the answer is yes. Yes, it is, because I love you very much. I do, I do. You're not gonna be on camera today. You're just gonna stay there and be cute. So is it okay to date a non-Christian? Sadly, this chapter itself is not so interesting. And in summary, Kristen and Bethany just say, no. <laughs> they say everyone should only be dating with the intention to marry and have children. If you don't marry a Christian guy, then it's not a real marriage. And what about the children? How could you ever indoctrinate them if they're learning about multiple perspectives from birth? Oh, the horror. That's basically it. <laughs> Let me read you some of this stuff as a summary. Before we unpack what the dating a non-Christian guy is a problem, we first need to ask this question. What is the purpose of a romantic relationship? Throughout scripture, godly romantic relationships are always paired with marriage in view. The Bible never portrays a picture of a pure Christ-honoring romance without marriage in sight. Why? Because romance isn't a standalone activity, it's a gateway leading us to the end destination. Marriage. When it comes to dating or marrying a non-believer, the Bible says you'll become like an unequally yoked pair of oxen. Basically, you're not a good match. You will encounter major, major spiritual differences, which will ultimately leave you spinning in circles. You won't be unified in the most foundational part of the Christian life, living for God's glory. The command in this verse makes it painfully clear that marrying a non-believer would be disobedient to God. This may seem harsh, but when we remember what marriage is ultimately supposed to reflect, the gospel, we will see how truly important this command is. And the thing is, I get that religion is a huge part of many people's lives and it's a big value that should be taken into account when dating. For example, as an atheist, I don't think I could ever date someone who is a fundamental Christian or Muslim, for example, because I disagree so strongly with many of their teachings and beliefs that I don't think that would be a good fit. These are things to consider, they're completely reasonable. However, I happily date other atheists, I'd happily date an agnostic, I've even dated some pagans because we still have a lot of shared beliefs and values and ultimately that's what's important. So yeah, I get discussing religion with someone and wanting to be on the same page with a lot of values and stuff. What I take issue with here is Kristen and Bethany literally saying, marrying a non-believer would be disobedient to God. That is absolutely shaming and disregards the fact that everyone's an individual. While plenty of people do only want to date and be in a relationship with people who share their religious beliefs, there are also plenty of people who are already in happy, fulfilling relationships despite religious differences. And to tell them that their relationships are wrong and they're being disobedient just seems cruel to me. My personal advice for this would just be, you know, if you're interested in someone who's a different religion to you, communicate with them. Like, simple as that. See what shared values you do have, see where the differences are, see what both your expectations are of each other, and then just go from there. And it's gonna be completely different for everyone. There's no right or wrong. And if you fall for someone of a different religion to you or no religion at all, that's not disobedient to anyone. Please, please don't let that shaming language affect you at all. Then they go on to list all the problems with dating a non-Christian. And if this was just reframed as like issues with dating someone with a different value system to you, it wouldn't be so bad. But instead it's framed as they're wrong and you're right so this will be a problem. It's just not very nice. They say regardless of how nice, moral or fun a non-Christian man may be, don't compromise on this choice. Obey God's word, heed God's warning signs, trust that his ways are better, place God first in your life. <laughs> And then to end on a lighter note, I haven't really spoken about this much in these videos, but at the end of each chapter, Girl Defined have these study pages where they ask their readers questions and give them space to answer. And usually these aren't all that interesting because they're just basic reading comprehension questions. But there's one in this chapter that had me giggling so much, where earlier in the chapter they described the origin of the term yoked and how it comes from this story about oxen in the Bible and all this stuff. And then they instruct their readers, who I remind you are not five-year-old children, but young women old enough to be considering marriage. They instruct them to draw a picture of what you think an unequally yoked pair of oxen would look like. <laughs> oh my god, you can't make this stuff up, can you? I know, are you having a giggle, baby? Are you? Little giggle guts? Little giggle guts? You're so good. 
The next chapter is slightly more interesting and it is called Qualities to Look For in a Future Husband. Um, and I was planning on talking about this in this video, but my head is pounding and my voice is about to give out. So I am gonna throw this in the next video instead that I'll hopefully film when I'm feeling a lot, lot better than this because I think I'm about to die. So yeah, we'll cover that next time. But this is where I'm gonna end this today. Thank you for watching. Thank you for putting up with me in my ill state. So while there were some minor issues with parts of this book, these definitely feel way more fluffy and not half as bad as the other bits of this book that we've read and discussed so far. But like I said in the beginning, even though they weren't quite as interesting or dramatic or bad and terrible and whatever, I still felt it was worth co covering because, you know, life isn't all just pure outrage and drama, is it? I think it's good to cover the good with the bad and the in-between as well. And honestly, with how well I've been, it was nice to do something just a little bit less intense for once. So in the next part of this book, we're going to learn about Girl Defines Good Qualities to Look For in a Man. And we're going to learn what to do once a man has expressed interest in you and so on. Preparing for marriage and all that good stuff. Like I say, there's only one more part of this video review coming and that will probably be when I get back from Glastonbury. Um, but in the meantime, please let me know down in the comments. Uh, what you thought of this video. Would you ever date someone of a different religion to you? And ahead of the next chapter, let me know what you think are some good and important characteristics to look for in a partner. And in the next video, we'll find out whether Kristen and Bethany agree with you or not. So, thank you for watching today. Thank you for putting up with my ill self struggling through. Um, thank you for your patience. I hope you enjoyed this and um, I'll see you again soon. <laughs> oh, thank you.